Hello, everybody, and welcome to Signs of Change, a digital gallery opening brought to you by the Chicago Mosaic School and the Gallery of Contemporary Mosaic. My name is Ian Wojciechowicz, one of the folks tasked with bringing you the show this evening. First off, welcome. I know this week has been particularly insane, so I'm happy to have the opportunity for us to, to take a look at some artifacts of true protest, true solidarity. Hopefully that'll be a welcome sight after everything we saw on Wednesday. That being said, we're going to see a lot of different stuff tonight. Uh, we're going to have a couple conversations. We're going to speak with one of the co-curators of the show, Ben Blunt, from his studio in Evanston. We will be speaking with one of the artists featured in the show, Natalia Virafuentes. We're going to hear a couple of readings in the space from readers Elizabeth Marino and Benji Hart. Um, we will also be speaking with the Director of Communication and Outreach for Brave Space Alliance, Jay Rice. Brave Space Alliance being one of the organizations partnered with Chicago Mosaic School for this gallery opening. And then, of course, we're going to be seeing a lot of work, a lot of protest signs, a lot of prints, a lot of photography from the gallery. Uh, I hope you'll like it. It's going to be very, very interesting, very fun. Um, but first, we're going to take a little walk through the gallery, and then we're going to speak with Karen Ami herself, the founder and executive director of the Chicago Mosaic School. I will be back at the end of the show for a little wrap-up, but until then, enjoy.
April 1st, 2020 was our 15th anniversary, April Fool's Day, uh, 2020. And this year it was quite, um, quite quiet because we had shut down um, because of COVID. So, you know, this was the year that uh, we were going to celebrate how we have grown from a tiny studio space on Ashland Avenue um, and over the years into this beautiful, almost 10,000 square foot uh, art facility. We have, um, we've gone from a couple of classes a week to over 80 classes and workshops um, offered by, taught by world renowned artists who have flown into Chicago for uh, the last 10, 11 years for sure, it, more actually, um, from Japan and Italy and France and Scotland and England, you know, Great Britain. And it just, this year it stopped. Mm -hmm. But what we do, and we have a, we have we have students that come from Australia, and they come from South Africa, and they come from India uh, to Chicago specifically to study this art form, which is ancient, ancient art form. But the way we teach it is within a contemporary context. So we definitely acknowledge and have our training uh, in the history of mosaics and understand the process of creating work uh, in that way, in the, using those techniques, but to create within more of an art school model, which is um, finding your voice and learning how to, to use tools and techniques to speak better and more clearly. You know, when you walk into our space, you walk into the gallery. So you see this work and you see this sort of pristine space, which is meant to be uh, inspirational mm -hmm. and aspirational so that you can be in awe of the work that you see and then go back into the school and learn how to create mm -hmm. something that powerful. But uh, we are the only school uh, like like the Chicago Mosaic School. There is no other school like it in the United States. There's only three major schools for mosaic art um, in the world, and two of them are in Italy. Mm -hmm. So um, we're very different than those schools overseas. So, and we're more of an art school. Sure. The other schools uh, tend to be more trade school oriented, mm -hmm. teaching primarily technique, and we um, like to expand beyond technique into why are you making that? What do you want to say? Let's develop that and those ideas. And it also um, is necessary to know drawing and sculpture, writing, uh, storyboarding, color theory. I mean, there's all this stuff that you know, applies directly to any art form and that doesn't uh, exclude mosaic art. So we offer a lot of that stuff too. And we also teach stained glass, teach watercolor, drawing, ceramics. So there, there are a few mosaic artists that are doing political more political uh, oriented work. And, uh, you know, there's also uh, uh, graffiti artists that might be considered mosaic, like uh, Invader, who sure. does sort of pixelated stuff. Um, and also there's a lot of public art that has um, social justice messaging in it. Uh, the thing about mosaics that's really cool is that you can sort of be subliminal uh, in your messaging. So it's buried within all the pieces. And so initially it could look like a flower or a sunset or a beautiful uh, 
landscape, but when you get up close, there may be embedded images within within the work that you can't uh, discern until you get close to it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the great things about mosaic is that there's so many little embedded hidden things within the work because each piece is put in specifically and individually. So you can really have a lot of power and control within that mm -hmm. to manipulate the viewer. A mosaic is all these elements that pull together to make one whole. And that's exactly what the gallery is. Because if you look at our uh, signs of change show, there's all these different things that don't look like they relate to each other, but they do. There is a thread of, of common uh, passion running through each and every one of those pieces. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only curator uh, at the school, we've had guest curators and also uh, Lucy uh, Center and I uh, work uh, in creating a calendar alongside other artists that have, have suggested things to us or, um, you know, we, we brainstorm ideas. Uh, people look to us for inspiration and most of the work that we show is trained artists who have skills in mosaic horn just pasting things together. Um, so that's one of the, that's a criteria that we usually employ when we're doing a mosaic show. And I think it, it speaks really well of the show that there is such diversity, not only of views, but of skill levels in, in, uh, in creating those signs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different, you know, some people just made it like you could tell in five, 10 minutes, you know, some of them, like some of the embroidery pieces, for example, those are like very time intensive and very carefully manipulated. And I, I think, you know, seeing those side by side a lot, uh, alongside different messages of Black Lives Matters and, you know, uh, the cash bail and pro-choice and, uh, you know, there's just seeing the photographs of of those signs being used mm -hmm. in situ it, yeah. at a protest it's pretty powerful uh i have been to many protests here in chicago for many years not just this year and some of the signs and artwork and clothing and photography that i've seen uh at just the protests here in chicago are awesome, outstanding. People are so directly aligned with their own voice. And I think, you know, signs and when, you know, you feel like your, your home is threatened, your, your future is threatened, your security is threatened, uh, your future is, is being changed. But unless you stand up and, and speak out, uh, that's why these these signs are so dramatic in a way because a lot of the the signage that you do see in in our show those aren't necessarily artists a lot of those people those are those are those are citizens who need to speak out and use whatever tools that they have to put a message out there immediately Sure. So it's a twofold um, scenario, really, with with taking things that are out on the street that are meant for in the moment, mm -hmm. and then putting them in a pristine white wall space where really it's it's not it's, galleries generally aren't seen as you know um, street accessible. Sure. You know that walk in friendly places. They're more for upper echelon and educated and, um, you know, there's a snobbery that's that's attached to a, a fine art gallery. So there's that aspect of taking that street art and putting it in, within a white vanilla box, mm -hmm. right? And that also uh, creates uh, an audience of those people that would attend a white box 
to be exposed to something that they may not see, you know, because they would avoid those situations. They're sort of having to see them now in an art space, yeah. in a fine art space. Mm -hmm. We show a lot of mosaic art in our gallery and with mosaic art, each piece is very time and skill intensive. So, you know, the, when people come in to our gallery, usually to see mosaic shows, they, it's a quiet space, it's very clean and they're coming and they're looking specifically at these pieces, you know, that are, you know, very hand wrought, mm -hmm. very tenderly created. And so this is a completely different experience where you're sort of bombarded with messages. It's not peaceful. It's it's not meant to be peaceful. It's meant to be thought provoking. I'm not saying that our other shows aren't, but this is really more in your face and in the moment of the times we're in. I mean, we are constantly aware of, of present times. Uh, as artists, not just as mosaic artists, I just want to say as an art center, as a space for expression, free expression, safe expression. And so there's a lot of conversation that happens in, in, at the school, mm -hmm. a lot of conversation among the students, uh, among the staff. Uh, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of fear. And so we want to support uh, not only other artists, but we want to support other non-for-profit organizations to, because we're all, we all feel like we're together in this, that we're just another part of uh, freedom. Yeah, we had seen an installation that he had done. Mm -hmm. And so that, that like pulled everything together for us. Because also, you know, I know I'm a white person, I'm a white woman, you know, and so I, I know who I am and I know that, you know, we need to have other voices, not just from here. I mean, Ben is, was, was exactly where, um, and speaking, uh, with the with the signage that we saw that he was doing exactly what we wanted to see in the gallery and that's something that you know the chicago mosaic school will always do i mean we, we yes we're in covid yes our classes are online now we have this gorgeous space we want to use it as much as possible for good uh, with by collaborating with other artists with other organizations uh, and people in need for food drives, whatever we can do to m improve the scene. And so, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're not isolated. It, it, you know, it's so much better when you can do good, even if you don't profit from it, even if, you know, it, your name isn't on something, just, uh, it, it's a wonderful thing to know that, you know, your neighbor is cared for. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, apathy has has um, been part of our all of our lives for a very long time, where we just sort of accepted things as they were. Yeah, they're bad, but, you know, I'm so comfortable right now. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to do anything about it. But, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that this is the year where it's like, yeah, you know what? can't be apathetic anymore. Mm. Yeah, I, no. And I know I mean, that I speak for everyone who's affiliated with the Mosaic School. It's an incredibly loving, giving, selfless community. And I hope that people will come and see us and someday in the not far <laughs> off future, hug us. <laughs> and I think also we want to be sure that everyone knows we do have a catalog. We are splitting the proceeds with several organizations. One is Brave Space Alliance. Um, there's, but there's several um, uh, listed on the back of the catalog. Yeah, it'll be through our website and also in our shop, our shoppy that we have at the school. 
Uh, but yeah, you can order them through our website or you can come in and get one. My name is Jay Rice. I am the Director of Communications at Brave Space Alliance, the only and the first Black-led, trans-led LGBTQ center on the south side of Chicago. Essentially, we are an LGBTQ center, but we are also in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, one of the elements of an LGBTQ center is meeting in person, right, and giving those in-person um, equitable resources that Brave Space gives out. So we have had to switch things up, right? Um, our support groups and our mutual aid groups moved into a virtual setting and then we meet on Zoom and some of those groups consist of a trans feminine group, a trans masculine group, and a non-binary group. Uh, we also have a housing uh, stability and food security uh, mutual aid groups uh, that we've all, that we've transferred all of those into a virtual setting now. Mm. Um, in addition to that, our mutual aid also looks like, you know, on the ground direct um, mutual aid. So we have our crisis pantry, which started at the beginning of the pandemic. And it started out of necessity. Um, and, and like, I like to stress so often that when there are necessities that society has and your government, local and national government, are not stepping up to help you meet those necessities. It's always organizations like Brave Space Alliance that steps up and is like, okay, we got this. Uh, and, and it's noted that it is, it is always, always due to the work of black and brown queer folks and black and brown trans folks who are out here feeding everyone. Uh, I like to make a note that our crisis pantry isn't just for LGBTQ folks. Uh, everyone is able to access that. And with that being said, we are the only LGBTQ run uh, food pantry in the Midwest. So <clears throat> it's important when those intersectionalities uh, meet and align, especially when we pick up the slack that's left over by our governments uh, in a pandemic, right? This, this is, this is a, a lot of us this is our first global pandemic. Uh, so when the idea of mutual aid has had to evolve. Um, and that's what we did. And we fed over 15,000 people in the first three weeks. There are two aspects to our crisis pantry. You can either sign up and get food delivered to your house if you're immune compromised, if you can't leave, if you're quarantined, whatever it may be. We'll drop off a pantry bag to you. Um, or you can go to any of our pantry network sites and grab food. Um, so there's that uh, over the, let's see, I think it was the 18th and the 19th, we did a free hot meal giveaway. Uh, which was extremely important because around mm -hmm. the holidays, you have so many folks who are like, yes, you know, yeah, turkey drive, yeah, we got Thanksgiving, let me make sure I do that. And then Christmas, let me make sure I do that. But then there's, what about these weeks in between, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, set, we teamed up with our community partner, Chef Fresh, and um, some other folks called Chef Friends for Justice. Uh, and we were able to link up with uh, Yvette's uh, in Chicago, a really dope restaurant. Mm -hmm. And we gave out over 400 meals. And that was one day of it. And then the next day, we teamed up with Chef Fresh. And we dropped off meals directly to uh, LGBTQIA plus black and brown folks in Chicago, uh, which was a task. But it was fun, and it was fulfilling, and it was amazing. And that's actually something we're going to continue every month. As, as much as we can, delivering hot meals to folks. Because it's one thing to have pantry items. It's a whole nother feeling to have something that's warm, you know, and, 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 and delicious and right there. Um, so in conjunction with that, we also run a lot of different actions uh, and protests around the city with providing, uh, whether it's anything from Gatorade, PPE, medical, um, 
type um, type help, us, such as gauze and, and, and alcohol wipes and, you know, things like that. And we even had like some IVs at one point, you know, and that's our other focus is, is community coordinating in a way that perpetuates liberation for everyone. Mm. Uh, again, we're an LGBTQ center. We are a trans-oriented LGBTQ center, but, you know, especially with the, the shit that happened yesterday, uh, and, and you look at civil rights movements and you look at the change that's happening, it has always been black and brown queer folks that have been at the forefront of that change, just like it was true back when Martin Luther King was marching. It is true now that we're at the forefront of these movements. Uh, we're putting our bodies on the line. So even though we're LGBTQ center, because it's our people out there, we have no other choice but to be like, okay, hey, what do y'all need? Yeah. Not only what do you need, let me lend my voice to this movement as well. I mean, we were at a lot of the protests. Uh, me personally, we were we was there. We spoke uh, at a lot of different protests and actions. And you're right. I mean, it's a plethora of different issues, right? But it all stems under that umbrella of uh, liberation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was definitely lessons that I learned, you know, learning the different ins and outs and the different politics of uh of what's going on, especially specifically here in Chicago, like you mentioned, cops out of CPS, and that being a broader issue of defunding the police. So oh, yeah, yeah. Um, kind of bringing it back into how people can get involved because that's our like number one question. Mm -hmm. The best way to stay up to date with uh, Brave Space Alliance is through our social media channels, um, and mainly our Instagram uh, at Brave Space Alliance. Uh, we also have a Twitter, and we also have a Facebook like page we are able to put out um, different needs and different asks, like if we need pantry items for that day, directly to the people. And that's how we've been able to sustain a pantry that has fed uh, to this date over 80,000 people. We are an independent pantry. We do not get any help from like any big uh, food depositories or anything like that. It is just it's strictly based off of uh, the folks who are watching this right now, folks like folks like you who donate to our crisis pantry, who donate to the sustainability of Brave Space Alliance, and who donates when when you donate to us, you are literally supporting the liberation of oppressed people. Like there's no other way to put that. Like when you are supporting us, you are supporting the liberation of everyone, uh, and especially Black and Brown trans folks. Um, and here in Chicago, when we're looking at the trans community. I mean, just in the past two months, we've lost two Black trans women to trans violence. Just in the past two months, one on Christmas Day and one yesterday morning. Um, so the violence that we face is real. Um, the violence that we face is intra-community violence as well, as, as much as it is facing from white supremacy, facing from police brutality. We deal with intra-community violence as Black trans, as Black and Brown and Indigenous trans folks. Um, and that is why BSA is here, to offer those resources that make Black and Brown trans folks feel seen in the city. And that's our mission, and that's what we're here to do, and that's what we have been doing for the past three years um, here in Chicago. So it, it, it is, it's, it's to the support like from people like you. We have so many volunteer opportunities. The easiest way, again, is to kind of check out our Instagram and see what that is. But you can sign up for volunteer emails. If you go to www.bravespacealliance.org and hit that volunteer tab, you can sign up for different emails and kind of get on our volunteer queue. We're always looking for people uh, to uh, to drive different pantry items, different places, uh, to help out with the uh, hot meal giveaways every month. Um, wherever we we never know we are living in uncertain times so <laughs> I might call you up like okay great we need six people here <laughs> right now because we have to open up our doors and keep people safe mm -hmm. so that's what it is so I advise if you want to volunteer we would love that we also appreciate uh, reoccurring donations that's something else you can sign up for on our on our website underneath the donor tab I mean, it's just like Netflix or Spotify. You can make this like a little subscription. It can be $5. It can be $500, all depending on how your privilege is set up. But yes, that is what keeps the sustain is reoccurring donations and a amazing volunteer base and programs like this one.
Five, these three pieces are responses to some of the jazz of Nicole Mitchell, and they've been published in my book, Asylum, by Vanguard Press, just came out. First is Meadow, Sunlight in the Swinging Field. We think of soprano flute as something light, butterflies, lighter than air, and its flutist under the sun, rarely a first chair, butterflies. But keep in the back of your mind, butterflies. Say breath equals life. Nicole contracts under her sun and releases her breath to fly. Hold and reach each audience member until they reach her, reaching. Whether the idiomatic logic that goes on in her or Joni's head allows her students to follow butterflies. But she never simply imitate her, sun down, or she is a teacher who allows her listeners to sing or urges her students to fly on their own. There is that pedestrian art and butterflies and those airs that limb the marvelous sun. Two, the indigo trio, Miko Mitchell solo flute. Grasshopper in black leather sings in the dead of night. Take this sound and push it to the end of my fancy. Far into the waking day, jumping till no pincers find a place to name land. Grasshopper in black leathers sing in the dead of night. Here I am, here, here, here I am. Come, catch me. Sonic projections. It's as if somebody is moving heavy furniture into a tiny apartment. The acoustic piano breaks in. Put that there. A tuft of red against thick brown wool. Plead. That touch of sound, the chaos roars back. A rough lyrical intervention matches growl for growl. The quartet pleader sways and flip-flops, urging, prodding, coaxing, and stomping out a sound, lifting it high above her head. That rough lyricism again, good dark chocolate with red peppers. Uh, yeah, they reached out to me. I can't remember if it was Karen or Lucy, but they reached out to me through email, uh, talking about what they wanted to do and play together prints and work that people were using kind of in protest and like addressing their current situation and yeah, asked me whether I want to be involved, like co-curating it. It was it was collaborative. I mean, they put a call out and um, I promoted as I could through kind of sure. social media. I think, you know, their call is a little larger than mine probably, sure. but uh, I went to pull in some letterpress printers that I knew that would have been making work along this vein and might want to contribute stuff. So, um, yeah, it was a collaborative effort. Yeah. They uh, initially wanted it to be work that people actually use in actual protests. Sure. So you can see some real protest signs, you can see the wear and tear on some things. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know a lot of press, a lot of other press printers were making work, and 
just making a stack of posters and leaving it outside of their print shop and like just grab this and take it. So I'm not sure if those were actually used or just had leftovers, but uh, that same poster from that same edition, the same run, was definitely out in the streets and people were using them. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think printmaking is uh, kind of uniquely qualified to be a medium right now. Um, yeah, it's a literal, it's a very democratic, democratic multiple. I mean, you can make lots of copies pretty cheaply. Uh, the cost is basically paper and your labor. And a lot of printmakers kind of took up the call and decided to do that. I have a friend, a printer friend uh, in the Washington area who invited young activists into her studio and said, if you have something you want to print, if it's two or three lines, you can come in and print it. So there are people giving access. So we have this equipment that allows us to put uh, words on paper, get it out there. And so um, using that as a kind of a conduit for our messages or other people's messages, I think it's an important use of, of the medium. That his death at this time, uh, all the work he's done leading up to this as a example for people, I think it was like people wanted to highlight his life and just that good trouble phrase is so perfect for right now like people getting involved in things in ways that it never had before and figure out how you can get your own version of good trouble whether it's writing letters writing postcards walking outside with a sign i think people were figuring out ways to get in good trouble any way they could and, uh, as we got more and more submissions submissions in the idea expanded a little bit because sure. i was thinking it was just going to be things that were used in protest mm -hmm. it's like Ideally, that would be an interesting show, but as people sent more and more things in, you see they still connected or made sense for the show, but they might not have been used in protest. And then someone capturing that moment, uh, putting all these posters into a context, I thought was an interesting uh, idea. And so, yeah, all these other things that kind of fit that really huge painted sign is, uh, you know, visually it's awesome, but it's, you know, it's not a multiple, it's a one-off, but it really fits too, I feel like just, uh, gives a lot more energy all the different kind of pieces relating to each other all on a, on a larger theme that's all still really very current very right now very energetic yeah i like the idea of like yeah the idea of using memes in print like are you doing that to get people's attention mm -hmm. or do you want to say something unique a unique way to spin on something that people have been saying a lot of times so i love the different tactics because it's a poster a poster is like mm -hmm. a mini billboard trying to get people's attention what people to see what you want to say and so it's like the thought and the design behind people's signs is really cool too. Like, yeah. There's a lot more behind it besides just writing down the first thing that comes to mind. One thing I thought was really great was the work that we put up at the very entrance of the show. Three very different mediums, like working in very different ways I thought was really cool. cool like it, it's a great way to kind of open it when you walk in the door. Uh, the painting is really huge, really colorful. Again, it's a painting so there's one of them. Uh, the Black Lives Matter sign, we were doing these, um, a movement to put Black Lives Matter sign all around kind of Evanston. And so we sold, I don't know, thousands of signs. And so that's a multiple in the most kind of commercial way. That, you know, it's not even hand printed, it's printed by a machine on like really cheap material uh, meant for people to display, you know, outside during the weather. And then this embroidery, which is you're sitting on your lap, like hand done. I mean, just, just the three approaches to this uh, larger thought or larger idea, I thought it was really cool to have them together on the wall. And the way the show is hung, it's like everything isn't framed. These are not like gorgeous works of art that are selling for hundreds of dollars that someone's setting. You know, these are like, not that people didn't give them thought, but they're, you know, people sat down and did them. It's fairly yeah. immediate and like it's hung to be that way that it's kind of ephemeral and. Yeah, I just, I, I just love the, the kind of the energy of the show.
Natalia Virafuentes, and I'm a painter and muralist. Uh, for my art, I usually, um, I, I guess I, I paint like using my subconscious more. Like I try to, it's kind of like a meditation type uh, where I'll have the canvas out. I don't really think of where it's going to go or anything, you know, I'm just like, I like this color, this blue looks good. And then I start moving it around the paint, mark making, but it's all just like my subconscious. So it's like cutting out my conscious and just using my subconscious and letting it flow, the energy from within and letting it produce whatever is within me wants to come out. <laughs> yeah, if that makes sense. So it's a lot of energy work too, you know, um, just um, I would imagine us as vessels and something from within us is like trying to transmit or coming out. You know, like my hand would automatically just be moving. I don't even question it, you know. I'm like, if this is what the hand wants to do or my mind wants to do, then so be it. Sooner or later, it'll turn into something. And then that's how I started doing, like, the faces and the portraits. Um, so it's a lot of, like, energy. I have one, like, in the back over there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's mostly what my work is. And I've been switching. I've always done drawing and painting since, like, I was a child. So... Uh, I took like after school classes. Like in my elementary school, they didn't have great art classes. So I would take classes after school. I did Marwin, Gallery 37, you know, and that made me explore so many mediums. You know, at Marwin, I could do digital painting. So once I, before I did like, when I was in elementary school, it was a lot of black and white and realism. I'm like, it has to look the same. It has to look the same. Went into high school and then started painting. And I was like, wow, I can, Painting can do anything. Even if I mess it up, I can cover it up. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> no things to worry, nothing to worry about. With pencil, it's just like that mark's there. I won't be able to erase it properly. Or maybe if I did it like very lightly, maybe. But if it's really hard, I can't. Mm -hmm. And then into going into college is when I started doing more experimental, going 2D, 3D, you know, like whatever I felt um, felt good. Yet again, goes back to the automatic like feeling and just going with it, you know, going with the flow. Before all of this, before this year, I really didn't do too much activism. I would document it maybe in my sketchbooks or in, uh, but I wouldn't do big statement pieces until like with everything that was happening, I'm like, man, I got to go out there too. I have to do something, you know, I have to put a message out there and just like bring out a different energy to the people or make them seem, be more aware of themselves and their surroundings of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So with the faces that I was doing, the, uh, originally they were like looking to the side, undirect, you know, not the, they weren't having the gaze towards the audience. It was always to themselves looking at beyond. But once uh, the rioting happened and all that stuff with Black Lives Matter, uh, I started like directing the gaze at the viewer, you know, I'm like, look at yourself, look at what's happening, look within yourself, you know, what feels right and what the pain or every, I just wanted people to really reflect, you know, pause and reflect and have a deeper feeling of what's happening instead of just like walking by and whatever, you know, like, or like posing next to it. Like, I'm like, I want you to, I wanted them to think more as they're, as they're looking at it, you know, like more of a reflection from within. And I wanted to do that with the protesting and everything, just because it does go hand in hand, just because it is all about the energy and you want to, show like a positivity too but at the same time capture what's really happening out there you know you don't want just happiness i'm like sometimes we could do more um uh, realistic things you know or even if it is kind of sad you know but that's the reality of things um, um urban art restart um uh, i i started with them the, they reached out to me because they were doing boards um uh, by uh, Edgewater and I Lauren was the one that was talking to me the most and communicating with me uh, and they just seemed cool you know and I was like why not I'm gonna work with these guys they seem chill and they want to do a lot in different neighborhoods too you know mm -hmm. so it wasn't really concentrated in the middle of Chicago you know they wanted to spread out a little bit more to the edges and all that stuff too mm -hmm. and I just, I enjoyed working with them. So uh, they kept hooking me up with other things like the mosaic um, school. I was just like, oh, sure. I didn't even know about it. And they're like, yeah, we're going to take it. And we're going to do it over here. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, 
Uh, as long as you have it, you know, I know it's safe. Keep displaying it. You know, people have to feel that energy too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they've been great. And uh, I think they've just been trying to like help the artists too and the neighborhoods and the, the businesses mm -hmm. a little bit more and just kind of beautifying the spaces. Um, that one, uh, it says amor and paz, so love and peace, pretty much. I wanted to include more text because of the whole, um, a lot of people kept questioning, like, so what does this mean? What does this painting mean? What does this do? And I, and I just kept telling them it's just a lot of, about the energy from within and then reflecting upon yourself and looking around and being more aware. So then I started adding text. I wanted to be something more specific, you know? And then I've been writing a lot in English. So I was just like, man, I should be writing in Spanish too or in different languages, you know? Like, why should I just stick to English? So um, I'm thinking of doing like different um, versions of it with different languages, you know? Um, but it's also uh, about putting out that energy and letting people like look and reflect upon it. Yeah, so I did two, of the, two pieces for that show. Um, yeah, man, uh, I pumped them out real quick because they wanted them to cover the, the buildings really quickly or the windows, and I only had two days. I'm like, okay, day and night, day and night. I'm like, I got this. I got this. These, they're going to look great. The windows are going to look beautiful, <laughs> and they're going to be very happy with it. Yeah. Um, So the poem that I'm going to read is called Leilene's Bill with Revisions for Leilene Cubile Polanco Extravaganza, an Afro-Dominican trans woman who was found dead in her jail cell at Rikers Island Prison um, in June of 2019 while she was in solitary confinement. Uh, and I wanted to read this poem, A, because what it is is a palimpsest. It's a, both a record of the bill that the city of New York uh, attempted to pass in her name, but it's also a striking through and a rejecting of that bill and reimagining a world where Black trans people are actually free, um, happening on the page side by side next to each other. And sort of that graffiti element, that palimpsest element, I think is really relevant, not just to the struggles we saw this year, but the reimagining that we saw this year and the rejecting of uh, the state's offers of of reform and concession and, and actually putting forth much more radical visions for what Black people, trans people, immigrant people, poor and working class people actually require to be free um, and actually require to live full lives. Um, and so that's sort of the spirit of this poem and why I wanted to share it today. Leilene's Bill with Revisions. For Leilene Cubile Polanco Extravaganza, The New York City Council will pass a package of legislation expanding services for transgender, gender non-conforming, non-binary, and intersex inmates. Scratch that. We'll turn out its pockets, never sign another ransom note. All officers with trans inmates in their custody will undergo a competency training. Scratch that. We'll have their badge numbers etched off with diamond-tipped acrylics, aquamarine. New beds will be added to the transgender housing unit. Scratch that. Beds of wildflowers will erupt from lots that were not vacant, just holding their breath. Counselors will be made available to all trans inmates. Scratch that. We are each our sister's council. The Board of Correction will convene a task force. Scratch that. We'll be tasked with something useful, like beekeeping or collecting rainwater. 
Sex workers will have their cases diverted to human sex trafficking intervention court. Scratch that. We'll spray paint the words, we are the intervention, on the courthouse rubble. The Rikers Island compound will be replaced by a series of smaller borough-based facilities. Scratch that. We'll slip into the rising Atlantic, the ribs of our dead prepared to cage it. Trans elders will be held in solitary confinement for their own safety. Scratch that. We'll have their charcoal locks retwisted in chosen hands. This legislation will take effect in the summer of 2020. Scratch that. We have never asked permission to sing. And that was the opening of Signs of Change brought to you by the Chicago Mosaic School. Uh, thank you again to everyone that contributed to the video, all of you that came to watch. Thank you to Karen Ami, to Natalia Vera Fuentes, to Ben Blunt for taking the time to sit down with us, speak about the show more in depth. Um, thank you to Elizabeth Marino and Benji Hart for those phenomenal readings in the gallery. Check their work out. They're wonderful writers. Thank you again to Jay Rice for sitting down and talking to us about Brave Space Alliance and the work that they do. If you have a chance, uh, check them out on Instagram, go to their website, uh, see if there's anything you can do to help. Um, and finally, if you, if you have a chance to go check out the catalog, please do at the Chicago Mosaic School website or in person at the Chicago Mosaic School. Uh, it's a wonderful way to take the show home with you, uh, to support the orgs that made it possible, to show people that maybe didn't get a chance to see it. Uh, it's a wonderful show. And thank you again for, for being here, um, for watching. And uh, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you soon.